Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Tulani Kuzwayo. A very warm thank you to Rooftech who sponsored this webinar. Rooftech prefabricates timber roof trusses and light steel truss systems for the residential and commercial market. They make nail plated trusses, bespoke exposed trusses and ultra spin light steel trusses. They have been involved with a number of really great projects in South Africa. One of them was being the repair of the 100 year old Lanzarote Hotel building in Stellenbosch, which was damaged by a fire. And another great project was the Green School in Pau, which is likely going to be the first living building challenge project in South Africa. This project has like really stringent requirements regarding materials in terms of FSC certification and any toxic ingredients in the timber. So the fact that they are participating in that or they're providing their materials to this project means that they are very healthy products. We'll post a link to their website in the chat box soon. And once again, thank you Rooftech for sponsoring this event. It, it really helps us to keep these webinars going. So thank you very much. Thanks Marlous, indeed. Thank you uh, Rooftech. And then this is for those of you who may have been with us uh, earlier than this year or last year yes, and maybe haven't been ever since. Yeah. The name has changed from Living Future to Regenerative Collaborative uh, South Africa. In fact, a few Sundays ago, I read something beautiful by Maria Popova about the name change from Brain Pickings to the Marginal Marginalian, which is her, her work. And she says something like this. Amid our slender repertoire of agency are the labels, agency, we, choose are the labels we choose for our labels, for of, our love. labels of love. The works of thought works and tenderness thought we make with the whole of who we are. There is no change in course beneath the name. And that resonates with us. So there's no change in course beneath the name of being regenerative, collaborative South Africa. We still promote re regenerative design thinking and projects and try to put together such like events or webinars online that are informative and inspiring. So we'd like you to walk away from here, gaining some practical value from attending a session like this. But the other programs that will start soon, uh, we're still busy working on a few other things on strategy and planning that have to do with advocacy, education and awareness and using various channels to do so. So follow us on LinkedIn as well as Facebook. And that is our email address, Regenerative Collaborative SA at gmail.com. That's where we are for now. The previous events, if this is your first time, some of the events that we've had, we've looked at realigning buildings with nature, and we've looked at net positive water as well as net positive energy and a few others. So feel free to log in there and see some of these events. And next year, we're going to see other themes that we want to look at. In fact, what we've discovered is that with these events, there's a whole lot of material within each one that those gave us an opportunity to get some more knowledge that we can put out there for you to, to benefit from and for you to participate as well. So today's session will be slightly different because we have noted the need for the audience to participate in the presentations or in this event. And for something like this mass timber construction, you obviously want to engage the, the projects you are working on and the questions you may have, technical or otherwise, that you, you want uh, to hear from the panel that we're going to have. So we'd like to give you that opportunity to engage with the subject matter experts. So to that end, we've structured it this way that the speakers will give brief presentations. So you'll have a total of four. And after they have all presented, we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions or to comment. So it may not be a question per se that you want to ask. It could be a comment, then you are free to, to make that comment. You'll just put your hand up so that for good order, in order for us to call up to call you upon to, to, to speak and, and, and have your say or ask your question. Now, just allow me to introduce the speakers, which will also give you a sense of the outline of the presentations you're going to have today. So we have Emma and David, who are both part of the founders of the Mass Timber Focus Group. And they'll be presenting and getting us to understand what is mass timber. So we're taking it from the basics, maybe the distinction between cross laminated timber and, and glue lamb timber and a few other phrases that are there that we find. And then they'll help us also appreciate an insight, maybe give us an insight into the key challenges that South Africa needs to overcome for this. In fact, uh, David, you've been quoted as saying 
that you're hoping that by 2025, each province in South Africa will have at least one mass timber building. So that's interesting. And then we'll have uh, Gerard is going to present, Gerard Bassi from uh, Forest Stewardship Council. And it will touch in the presentation. It will include some insight into how sustainable is mass timber really. And Gerard Bassi is the marketing manager and Manushka and, and Herit will also be participating when we get to the Q&A. And then Tessa was going to look at a building, the Ridge, where she was involved in the facade design. And she will share a project example and her experience with the design construction process. And Jamie from XLAM, uh, Jamie is the managing director of XLAM. They are manufacturer and provide associated services of cross-laminated timber in South Africa. So amongst other things, that presentation will take us through the inherent properties of the material and what to keep in mind when specifying it and some application examples. So now I'd like to hand over to Emma and David for the first presentation on what is mass laminated timber. Please over to you, Emma and, and David. Thanks everyone. You're welcome to our presentation. The outline of the presentation We'll start with a little bit of an introduction to the Mass Timber, timber Focus Group, and then we'll move over to what Mass Timber really is, global trends relative to Mass Timber, its relevance in South Africa, obviously the South African context, modern methods of construction using Mass Timber, sustainability, and then the last would be just fast facts about Mass Timber to help everybody just get a little bit of a broader overview of what it is. All right, thank you. All right, so an introduction. David actually started the Mass Timber Focus Group a couple of years ago when he visited that building. It looks quite beautiful, somewhere in Australia. And when he came back, he interacted with a number of architects and engineers, and they had no clue of what he was talking about. So that ignited the interest in setting up the focus group and our primary objective of the group is to spread the awareness of mass timber to interact with the AAC community and to show what the material can do so far we have six members we have david himself myself we also have franco Weaver, we have chris we have Arnis and we have brett so this is the group and yes this is what we are all about all right so what is mass timber? I think this is a term that is broadly used the world over and people in one way or another mistake it for ordinary logs or timber framing. But mass timber in itself is just engineered wood that involves gluing pieces of lumber together. Now, the lumber can be made of uh, from spruce, from pine, of recent also deciduous species. And when they are glued together, they form larger pieces or what is known as panels. Now on the slide, you'll see on the left hand side, that's a large panel and that is a mass timber panel. It is a structural element. It carries load and of course it's prefabricated and in a factory and assembled on site. Now there are various types of mass timber products. We have cross laminated timber, which is actually the most common one. Architects love it because it's the new concrete. I must admit that I am a, a concrete lover myself. I lecture con concrete and structures at the university, but I have found interest in um, mass timber. We also have dowel laminated timber, obviously, the lumber pieces are connected and pieced together with dowels. We have the glue laminated timber. You can have glue lamb beams and we also have the nail laminated timber. There are others. Laminated plywood, which is being used extensively nowadays. And so, so far these are, and amongst others, some of the mass timber products that you'll find out there. However, it is important for us to understand that mass timber is not timber framing. There's always that misconception of what it is. I recently attended a workshop with seasoned academics and they actually were slightly confused with regards to what mass timber is. All right, so looking at global trends, if we look at mass timber and what is happening internationally, there is an, in, um, well, it is estimated that the mass timber market in itself 
could reach about 3.5 billion US dollars by 2027, which is significant. And that obviously means that the industry is growing. It means that there is confidence in the material. Between 2013 and 2021, which is this year, there's been about 1,240 projects already in the US that have been built or are in design, which is great. The applications for mass timber predominantly is very much focused on bulk residential projects. We also have what you call it commercial office blocks, educational facilities, and also, as I said, public buildings. On the next slide, we would, you know, just look at some of the applications, again, just specifically focusing on the global trends. So we have tall buildings and at the moment, the accent building in Milwaukee in the United States should be the tallest building in the world once it's completed next year, 2022. It's about 25 stories, 87 meters tall. So the trends in, in mass timber is that there's been, you know, an increase in geometric complexities. Um, anything that one can dream of. I mean, you think about architects and the uh, brilliant designs, you can do that with mass timber. There's always a, also a growing use of modular applications. We have modular pods. This is very much used in hotel construction where you have the rooms prefabricated. So it's a, almost like a, a plug and fit in type of thing, a bathroom pods as well. There's also been an increase in hybrid uh, structures where there's a, it's a combination of concrete and of course, mass timber materials where you have a concrete core and of course, everything else around it is mass timber. There's also uh, the use of dowel laminated timber for bridge construction. On the screen is uh, some examples of uh, mass timber structures. We have the Michigan State University STEM facility. It's quite dear to my heart because I interact with a professor from there. Now, very interesting is that that building was an old power station and it was renovated into what you see on the screen. So it's almost like a, a combination of what existed and the mass timber structure. The building actually, in fact, in constructing that particular structure, they used about 3,100 harvested mass timber, that's cubic meters. And that building can actually, well, all the mass timber that was used can actually store about 1,850 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is excellent if we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. On the right hand side is the Latrobe student accommodation building. So you can see that uh, mass timber can be used for different structures the world over. All right, on the left is a hospital. And what is profound about that is liter literature or research indicates that the use of mass timber enhances wellness, enhances, you know, uh, health and well-being. So it is a key driver in terms of the SDG sustainable development goals. So it is a great material for hospital construction. Then of course on the right is what the accent building will look like once it is complete. It's relevance to, to South Africa if you look at mass timber as a material. Now we all know that South Africa is actually ranked uh, number 12 or so also in the global contribution to greenhouse gases. So climate change is an issue. So in order for us to improve or significantly reduce our contribution, we've got to look at alternative ways of either reducing our emissions or just doing things differently. We also have the housing shortage. The National Department of Human Settlement estimates that we have a housing backlog of about 2.1 million, which is more or less a problem which we can actually solve with uh, using mass timber technology. I must say that when it comes to housing, it's in twofold. You have your short-term housing or temporary housing rather, and then of course your permanent. When it comes to the temporary, I think we've all seen what has happened at George, where you know people need housing right now due to the flooding and all that. So having mass timber because it is fast, all some of the benefits you can assemble it in uh, you know a short period of time. We can meet some of these needs as we get along. Job creation, looking at the entire value chain of the mass timber industry from forestry to assembly, jobs can be created. I think 
if I um, remember correctly, the Department of Forestry or so indicated that approximately 160,000 job opportunities can be created if mass timber is adopted in terms of an economic potential for South Africa. South Africa is strategically positioned to export mass timber because of where we are. We're able to export either to the Europe, to Europe and to the Americas, North or South, and of course to Asia. Yes, David, I think it's your turn. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Emma. So I think uh, just going back to the the reason why Emma and Talani invited me to come and uh, share something with you, my, my passion. I've been in this industry for 25 years and have spent many Friday nights, midnight, casting concrete on 14-story green greenfield sites and uh, redevelopments of 20-odd uh, story buildings. And we all know that this is not an easy industry. And uh, when I saw that Darumu house in uh, Barangaroo uh, in Sydney, I, I firstly I couldn't believe it was timber because I saw the floor plates were also made from timber. And Jamie will be telling you more about those timber floor plates. And then when I came back, the engineers locally said, Dave, it's never going to happen, too expensive. And that's the reason for starting this, this simple group. And, and we have three, basically one mission because guys like Jamie and others in the industry, for them to invest in the value chain side, for them to invest in the supply side, uh, you need demand. So we created a small group to, to try and accelerate demand for mass timber in the country. And the objectives or the way to do that was to create awareness, what we're doing now. Uh, we're hoping to put some training together, all being well potentially with uh, Nelson Mandela University, we'll see. And then thirdly was to create reference projects. And I see just uh, watching the guys coming through the lobby, I see an engineer here that's and a developer that are looking at uh, a mass student housing, a three-story walk-up, and uh, we'll soon see if that's feasible. And I know there's many others of you that are here in the audience that are, are busy uh, in the planning stages of, of similar mass timber projects. Now, all of us have the same challenges. There's challenges in council, but I'm not going to talk to those because the other presenters will talk to them. So just briefly, before we finish. You know, wood has been around forever and Tessa knows that I like this slide from Norway. I was invited out there and to go to the Wood Technology uh, Institute in 2009. And here's an example of both the structure and the roof shingles being still in good condition after 1200 years. So some of those shingles are potentially replaced, but uh, the longevity of wood is undisputed if you know what you're doing. And then just another comment which most of you might not be familiar with is that wood it can do incredible spans if you design it correctly. Here's a 96 meter span at the Hammer Olympic Stadium. And if you arrive in Oslo Airport or Had the Moon Airport in Oslo, you will see the finished product of these beams that are spanning 100 meters, uh, complex timber beams. Now, this is one of my favorite buildings for a good reason. This building was built, you all recognize it, the Empire State. There seems to be a little gremlin the spelling. It was built in 1930, 102 stories in 14 months. Uh, the astounding thing is, and, and all of you are familiar with uh, McKinsey's graph showing that over the last 50 years, construction productivity hasn't improved. And this is maybe a, a good way to, a good visual way to see that. Here's a six month period from June 1930 to November 1930. And that's the kind of progress they were able to achieve on the site. Now, obviously, some of you are asking why, and many of you know why. And I think the, the, one of the benefits of mass timber is that it has the same potential benefit that steel had when they built the Empire State Building. So because they were using steel, they were able to do design for manufacture and assembly. You see that abbreviation DFMA, for those of you not familiar with it. So they were able, 100 years ago, to design those assemblies off-site and bring them to site and like Vicano, put them together and actually achieve a, a floor cycle record time of 14 floors in 10 days, which was the, the fastest they achieved. As architects and engineers, when you're choosing your materials, because these materials can be manufactured off site, you're able to unlock those faster program times. So just a, a couple of comments on the design centric nature. The modern methods of construction are design centric. So, you know, I don't know if you're Architectural engineering fees are going to go up, but certainly there is going to be more emphasis in design centric and, and maybe I know there are some 
improvements in, in Revit software towards level of development 400, but it's not there. But other programs like Inventor and Katia, those of you in the steel game that use Tecla or Bentley, it's the same type of thing, except now you're able to use other materials like mass timber. So from the 3D model, you're able to take stuff to the factory floor, what's called CAD to CAM. And those of you that have worked on various floors, at least uh, machines on the, on, the, on the shop floor, uh, you'll know what it means to take step files to cutlass for the various types of machines or to, to milling or to any type of machine center. The BIM I'm not going to talk to, just the fourth industrial revolution. Jamie's going to be speaking to us shortly and he's got a robot on the floor. And in order to, when you choose your material, it's material that you can use that can be manufactured off site and it's material that can be machined by, in, in this case, a, a robot. So typically 25% faster construction programs and because this is only an introduction, you know, mass timber is not going to change all the construction sectors, but it'll influence some. The modern methods of construction, we've seen more modular builds and we've seen the variation in those modular builds. Those of you who have seen online a bit of an artist who takes a normal dice and he creates uh, human portraits from it in the same way like you have in classical music variations on themes so modular building is becoming more geometrically complex. The uh, mass timber is the only renewable structural material that I'm aware of and uh, that, can, that is available on a commercial scale and again that makes a lot of sense and we heard about the hybrid buildings and uh, many of these for their, their lateral loading which some of the other presenters may mention are taken up by things like concrete lift cores. Just the last few comments before finishing. In terms of sustainability, I've mentioned that and, and out of interest, the K value of wood is around 0.13 watts per meters Kelvin for those of you that have to deal with the XA rigs and comparatively there's a, a clay brick at 0.82. We've again, we'll hear more about the carbon with the next speaker and it is like what we saw at the STEM building in Michigan. It's uh, suitable for adaptable reuse for we have a cradle to cradle approach. So the last slide, it's foster. Uh, it's the raw material is, is finished when it gets to site. It uh, sequesters carbon. It's, it's lightweight and strong, you know, typically 400 to 600 kilos a cube in comparison to concrete at 2400 a cube. And many people in South Africa say it's not labor intensive. It's going to take away some of the benefits of, of a traditional construction, but that is not true because that labor will basically move off site. And I think that's that's all from, from my side. Thank you. Thank you, David and Emma. Fascinating. I'm sure there are many questions already that folks are thinking of, and, and we'll get to that part just now. So Tessa, over to you, and you can take us through the Ridge project, please. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Tessa Brunette. I work at Arup and here in Cape Town, we have worked on a project recently that was completed towards the end of last year, where we used mass timber at a scale that has not been done in South Africa before. So very, a very exciting project. In this instance, it was used in the facade. So I'll be talking about that today. So David, you and I both share a love of stave churches. Clearly, this may even be the same stave church, although I think this is Hiddel in Norway. But one of the key things, which is exactly what David said, is that timber is often viewed as a material that cannot be outside. It's quite sensitive to weather. But actually, if you know how to work with it and you know how to detail and treat it, it's it's really it, it can last for a very long time. This, this stave church is a thousand years old and this is a church in Essex in the UK that's also many, many hundreds of years old. This was the slide that I was just adding in an attempt to talk about carbon because I think that the carbon sequestration aspect of timber is really important to understand. This may be quite small, I, sorry, I didn't have time to stretch it, but what this shows is that if we compare a concrete frame to a, to a timber frame, even with all of the stuff that you have to do to the timber, you're still sequestering carbon over that life. Even if you consider long transportation distances and, and all sorts of things like that, it's still infinitely better than, than looking at a concrete design. So we need to be moving towards timber. It's absolutely critical. Also, if we want to achieve the goals of a 44% reduction in carbon by 2030, there have been all sorts of studies. This is one um, that we as Arab completed a few years ago. And here, this says that actually, we need to have 90% of build of residential buildings in the world built out of timber in order to to actually meet these goals that that we've set out and are set out in the Paris agreement 
So important considerations with, with timber design are fire, treatment, weathering and maintenance are very important, as well as species selection. I'm not going to linger too much on each one of these because I do have seven minutes only, so I need to be quite quick. So this is the ridge, which is the case study that I'll be talking about today. So this was completed in 2020, and really the topic of this conversation is around the timber unitized facade, which is what we can see in the finished product here on, on the building. This is a slide that really just shows tries to summarize the, the process and how we, we came about designing and then fabricating and installing the timber facade. What you can see here is that there were a large number of players involved in this supply chain to design and then eventually install the timber facade. We have one of them on the call, so Jamie is on the call. Jamie supplied the CLT and was part of that design process, but it was much more than that. So we started off with a client who was willing to take the jump. So the VNA Waterfront was our client. We're very fortunate because it is this is significant innovation. There was a lot of capacity building across across the board, and it was very brave of the client to to make that commitment very early on. We worked together with the architects, Studio Mass. And then, of course, with the subcontractors, the, the main contractor was GVK, and the subcontractors were Gustain and Horak, who were the facade subbies, and then their subcontractor for the CLT was XLAM. Gary Holiday was also involved later on in the process for the specialist machining that they were able to provide. So, in terms of the, the design process, and the lessons learned. What I thought I'd do is break it up into the different design phases and then talk quite spe quite specifically to key lessons that, that came to mind when I was thinking about that. So in the design phase, what I should mention as well is that this process was incredibly fast track. We were working against time. I think we had like a few months to to finalize this design and then we were almost designing while, while, the, while the building was being built. That it was a very constrained design process. So early on and early decisions with the client and the architect and everyone really around expectations are really key, particularly the, the visual aspects, because in this the, a key benefit of timber is that you don't need to add things to it. The timber is the final product. But that also means that your raw material, your timber, needs to be exactly what you expect to see in the in the final product. So making decisions on what grade of timber are we going to use? How how are we joining different pieces of timber? You know, you have to understand your material quite intimately in order to be able to to make these decisions. And you have to make them early, otherwise your end product will will not be what what you want. Weathering as well is something that's really important to understand and the relationship of detailing to weathering. So quite small decisions like which way do you orientate the, the timber grain, for instance, have quite significant impacts. And of course, where you put drips to, for instance, push the water off the, the building or off the timber, that also starts to create an aesthetic impact that also weathers differently over the building's life. So it's quite important to understand all those things. During the detailed design process, we actually had a series of mock-ups that were part of our process, and that was incredibly useful. This allowed everyone on the project to try and, and to progress their design and the fabrication thinking up along a series of scales. So the first mock-up was actually a meter-by-meter meter assembly showing what the facade buildup would look like. Essentially, a CLT panel wrapped in a breather membrane, counter battens and some cladding on the outside of that. But then progressing that up and developing and going up in the scales was an incredibly useful process. It highlighted the, the need for the right tools for the job. And, and that was a process as well. You know, David's point about us needing projects in order to, to build capacity in industry is totally on point because the CLT industry right now is is in its infancy, and there's so much enthusiasm. But we we need to be making sure that that we're enabling that industry with the right tools in order to do the job that we want that industry to be able to do. Also, the design needs to be flexible to allow for tweaks. So this mock-up process and this trial and error error process that we that we went through 
during that process, there were key things that came out of that that we needed to incorporate into the design. And so it was really important that that, that design had the flexibility and it required a really hands-on process, a lot of which happened during COVID as well. So <laughs> that was quite a challenge going on, on factory visits, but having to get permits beforehand was, was quite a quite a thing. And then of course, during this process as well, they, because there's so many different people involved and so many different skill sets and, and capabilities, have, having the commitment of each of those people along the way was really important and pulling them together in a, in a coherent way was, was really a key success of this project because there was absolutely no doubting e any team members involvement or, or commitment rather. So this picture here is the mock-up, one of the, the first mock-ups that we did on the, on the project. And then all of these folk here are members of our project team trying out different things in, in the factory. And then that all went onto site, of course. And this, this image here is a photograph of one of, the, one of the aspects which is related to the design tweaks, because you have to understand your machines really well to know how wide things can be. And as soon as you change machines or, or perhaps approach, approach the challenge, to using a different machine, it changes the design assumptions. So in this particular instance, the width of our panel didn't work with the final machine that we used to, to cut the panels. And so we actually had to join them to, to get the, the desired width. So then after the design, uh, detailed design process and the mockups and all that, we cracked on with fabrication. So here we went through the process of, of really the raw timber, which was treated with a product called Vasco Azure, by Jamie at Exam, um, and and that meant that the really nice thing about that particular treatment is that it's it's completely neutral to to people. So a typical treatment used in timber are, are like CCA products, which are very very bad and have very significant wellness constraints if you happen to be next to those pieces of timber. But this particular treatment is very neutral, so that was desirable. And then here we can see how the CLT was fabricated or assembled into the CLT panel inside the vacuum press, and then how it came out at the other end. And then of course, those panels are all stacked up, and then they went through a cutting process using this, this CNC machine at Gary Holiday, and all the way through to the final product, which is our unitized panel. So the, the lessons here were the, that I've noted are that the design should follow the machine capacity, so specifically, we're looking at lengths and widths, and it's, yeah, in our instance, there's quite a lot of change, but it's really important to understand those. And then also the machine capability actually should drive the design and not vice versa, because otherwise you just end up fighting with the machines quite a lot. And that's, that's not a, you know, not a constructive place to be in. And then finally for installation. So the installation process actually went really smoothly. It is one of the be benefits of using a unitized facade system because once once the panels are fabricated off-site, as David said, that's where the bulk of the labor is focused, off-site in a safe environment where people can be standing up and they don't have to hang off sides of buildings to do things. So once those panels were fabricated off-site, they were then brought to the site and installed in this unitized facade in a very quick and easy way. The key things here were really around making sure that the timber was protected during transport adequately. Because it is a, an inherently soft material, it's quite easy to damage it. And so that was something where specific care was needed to be taken because the, the people who were installing it hadn't really used, um, hadn't worked with timber before. So they weren't, weren't familiar, you know, whereas they're very familiar with glass, for instance, as a product to move around. Also making sure that, that the timber is protected from weather is really important. So they, we happen to be halfway through the installation of the timber on this building when a massive storm came. <laughs> we knew it was arriving two days later. And so there was a lot of fuss on site to make sure that it was, it was protected, but still a lot of the timber did get wet. Um, and the, we, we did things to make sure it was fine, but that is just something to to keep in mind. So if you do have the opportunity to program your timber installation, like try and avoid the depths of winter because the, the water and the rain really does just make it a bit harder. The the really nice thing about timber as well is that you it's quite a forgiving material. So you can actually insert hooks to lift up the different pieces of timber in quite a lot of places. And that's quite nice. And then finally, the the FSC certification, just a point on that, is that 
it needs to be in place through all steps of the value chain in order for that certification to stand. So you can't just buy an FSC timber from a supplier, but then have none of the fabricators certified as well. So just keep that in mind for, for projects that you may be on. So this is the final installed timber facade. We've got the outside on the left and the inside on the right. There is an office that's installed here now. I just quite like this picture of the, of the kind of naked office space. We used 36 tons of CLT on this project, which we've calculated to equate to a saving of approximately 354 tons of carbon. And just as a, as a note on that, in order to capture 354 tons of carbon, 17,700 trees must grow for one year. So that's a phenomenal amount of trees. And just, I, I was trying to, to kind of capture how much carbon that is, because I think often the numbers can be quite, can, can become quite abstract. But um, yeah, that is quite, a, quite an impact that has been made. And this really is just the first step. It's really up to all of us to be understanding how we can use timber more on our projects to replace the conventional materials, which are very high in embodied carbon. So in terms, in terms of overall lessons learned, I'd like to just say that mock-ups are really, really important. It's not something that we typically do here in South Africa. It's not part of our standard design and fabrication process, but it really did bear fruit for us. It was an incredibly useful process and it, it had significant benefits on the design and on the installation ultimately. It allowed us to test out a whole bunch of things that would have been very dangerous <laughs> to have been testing out on, on the real the real life panels. Also, geometrical complexity must not be underestimated. We, on this particular project, you would have seen that the, the facade was zig and zagging. It's a sawtooth facade. Our idea of that, of the simplicity of that, wasn't necessarily realized through the detailed design. I think as the, the machinery capabilities kind of evolved, we, if we'd look back on it, we probably would have done things slightly differently. So it's quite important just to realize that. Then the third point is just around the local capacity and enthusiasm. But, you know, touching again on David's point, we really need projects. All of us need projects to be testing this and driving this innovation so that we can develop the really full capability and smooth delivery across all aspects of the value chain. And then just finally, from a facade perspective and on a cost perspective, the costs of this timber facade were equitable to a glazed aluminium system. They were very equitable, but that is including quite a lot of innovation and like lessons learned along the way that did add to the cost, but it was still quite equitable. So the observation I would make there is that because this was the first project of this type, I would argue that the next project and the next project and the project after that, each time as the, as the delivery becomes smoother, those costs will reduce. And actually we could end up in a situation where timber facades are cheaper than their glazed aluminium counterparts. And that would be a very exciting place. And then finally, this is the facade from the inside, which you can see is benefiting from dematerialization. So there isn't any other finish on the inside of that. And it's lovely and warm. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tessa. That was very informative and helpful. And for breaking it up like that. Okay, so now let's let's get to how sustainable is timber, is this mass timber construction. So I saw Gerard, you, you made it in. So if we can hand over to you now, give us a perspective from FSC. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tulani. So yeah, just thank you for, for this opportunity. Uh, really great to, to be part of this, this forum. And today we're just going to look at how sustainable is mass timber construction. So first of all, just maybe a little bit of information about the Forest Stewardship Council. So I think it's very important to note that forest or FSC certified forests obviously have various environmental, economic and social benefits. So the Forest Stewardship Council has been around for the last 27 years and is regarded as the world's most trusted sustainable forest management solution. We've been the, the, we are the original pioneers of forest certification. 
and our labeling basically tells customers that the materials used originate from sustainable and legal sources. So some of the key touch points in terms of the FSC, in terms of what we strive towards, is firstly zero deforestation. So although trees are harvested, okay, it's very important that there's no net loss of forest cover over time. Then the second area is that of environmental protection. So FSC certification requires biodiversity and high conservation areas to be protected. The next area of importance to us is fair wages and the work, and work environment for workers. So here we look at aspects such as training, safety, decent wages and gender equality for all forestry workers. And then the, the next area is that of respecting community rights. So here we look at communities that are affected by forest management activities, that those communities are engaged, consulted, and that their traditional rights are respected. So in, in terms of FSC, we also obviously look at areas such as, you know, ensuring a high level of protection for endangered species and natural forests. We also have influential support from very, very respectable other environmental NGOs, such as the World Wildlife Foundation. And I think the very important thing with FSC is that our standards are globally consistent but obviously they are applied locally. And then just a little bit about FSC's reach. So we are in 80, more than 80 countries worldwide. We have more than 230 million hectares under certification. We have nearly 50,000 chain of custody certificates and 1,802 forest management cert certificates. In terms of South, Af South Africa, we have um, 1.2 million hectares of net of plantation forests, of which a very high percentage is certified. It's as much as 85% of our commercial plantations are protected. Then, I mean, I think obviously this is a very important area for people involved in, you know, mass timber projects, it's, um, it's construction, is that FEC is very closely aligned to the SDGs and in fact provides a valuable tool in achieving your SDG aspirations. So out of the 17 goals, we uh, directly contribute to achieving 14 of those goals and then 40 of those, those sub-targets. So those are the, the 14 main goals there. We've recently just completed research, uh, in fact, about two, three months ago, research which we did back in 2017 and we basically you know obviously had eight countries that we'd benchmarked and we did the research again in 2021 and basically what this research shows us is that we obviously seen some very interesting consumer trends and what we've seen over those four years and in terms of the eight countries that were tracked south africa was part of that as well as a tracking country We've seen that the concern of climate change has increased from 26 to 41 percent. And then also obviously noted is the loss of plant and animal species and deforestation have also shown quite significant increases. And clearly, obviously, the disease and health issue was a big issue in terms of in terms of COVID. And obviously very apt in terms of obviously COP26 occurring this year. So obviously these are quite significant trends which consumers are obviously saying, hey guys, you know, take notice of this. We obviously want you to start doing something about it. So how does FSC certification work? Okay, so first of all, it all starts with forest management certification. So this is awarded to organizations who manage their forest operations in socially, environmentally and economically responsible ways. And here we're looking at the management of both natural and plantation forests that would fall under forest management certification. Bearing in mind that even in South Africa, although we don't have a huge amount of natural forests, the nat a lot of the natural forests we do have are adjacent or part of commercial plantations. Secondly, the second area is the, is our cha the chain of custody certification. So this standard pertains to when uh, the timber product is processed or transformed or changed in any way. It could be through remanufacturing, packaging or relabeling. And this is where, as the previous speaker mentioned, it's important to obtain a chain of custody certification in order to be able to pass the certification claim on down the supply chain. 
And then finally, obviously, your consumers. And, and that's why we, 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 we referred to the research previously, is that obviously, you know, consumers obviously are looking for the assurance that there is supply chain integrity in terms of the timber products or forestry products that they consume and use. And this is where we work very closely with brand owners and major retailers, where we enter into strategic partnerships and assist them in their procurement of FSC certified material. So if we bring this closer to the topic of today in terms of mass timber buildings, okay, so what are some of the benefits in terms of using sustainably sourced timber? Okay, Clearly, we know that there are well-known benefits of, of timber compared to other building materials. But here, it's very important to look at the origin of the timber, which is, which is really important. And that obviously brings in a big emphasis on following through with sustainable sourcing. We also know, as the previous speakers have mentioned, is that sustainably sourced timber building materials are obviously great storers of CO2. And then where we also put a specific focus in terms of FSC is just looking at species diversification, particularly when it comes to our tropical species, where certification is a very important added value factor. And it also enables one to kind of mitigate the risk the misuse of various species and obviously ensure ensuring their replenishment. Then we also have a, an initiative called our FSC project certification. And this is a very important communication tool for, for builders and developers to showcase their commitment to sustainable sourcing. We'll unpack that uh, in, the, in the next few slides. And obviously very importantly, sourcing FSC building materials enables one to support compliance with various green building systems. So in terms of our project certification, so this is something that's available to developers and builders where you basically can look at full project certification where at least 50% of your timber products, okay, are FSC certified, okay, there may be 100% FEC certified or FEC mix, which is basically a combination of, of recycled and virgin timber. But there's also an option of a partial project certification where certain parts of the project or components of the project will be FEC certified. So an example here could be things such as, for example, your joinery components or your cladding or your timber frames or your engineered wood products, okay? And obviously it enables, the project certification enables you to publicly state uh, that these are, are certified. So it's obviously something that is really useful to actually show your commitment to using sustainably sourced timber. And then obviously just relating this back to your green star credits ratings. Okay, so obviously clearly we all know these credit summaries very well. So obviously here we've got uh, elements such as material MAT8, material 8, which is sustainable timber, which obviously refers to the specification of certified and responsibly sourced timber. Clearly also in South Africa, in terms of our various sawmills and processes, there's obviously the opportunity to look at local sourcing. And then obviously, yeah, we all know, also know that timber, in terms of uh, design disassembly, also obviously plays an important role. So yeah, just a bit of a reminder in terms of the, the value of sustainably sourced timber. And I think that is the end of my story. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jared. That was good. That was fascinating. And you know, that distinction between full project certification and partial project certification. I'm sure others have more questions on on this. Okay, so thanks that you're able to to make it through there. So now let's have, I think, the final presentation from Jamie. So Jamie, you want to present on from a manufacturer's perspective, and there was a lot of reference to, to your work in previous presentations. So we're looking forward to your presentation. So over to you, please, uh, Jamie. Hi, again, okay. my name is uh, Jeremy Smiley. I run a company called XLAM in Cape Town. I believe we're the first manufacturer of cross laminated timber in South Africa, for sure, and possibly in Africa. We started before there was a standard in place for manufacturing cross laminated timber, and with mainly the work of the University of Stellenbosch and how they 
push the, the idea of getting mass timber into the market or in, as a product used in South Africa, they got a standard in place. So last year in April, there was a standard for CLT, which was propagated. It was SANS 8892, and it is a manufacturing standard, which is clone of the American and Canadian standard. So it's quite a big thing that there is a standard in South Africa. Most countries don't have a manufacturing standard for CLT. Even in Europe, there is draft standards, but most of the manufacturers actually give their own uh, calculations and statistics and uh, information about their panels. So it relates mainly to how the panels are made and the, and the quality control in there. And there is an international standard, ISO standard. So yeah, so we, we are a small scale manufacturer in comparison to uh, international manufacturers. We can produce around two and a half thousand cubic meters um, annually. In comparison to the larger European factories, they're looking at you know 25,000 to 200,000 cubes a year. So we're kind of a you know a startup CLT factory, but we can manufacture to the same standard that the larger manufacturers are doing. And a lot of what is kind of the the key of the whole mass timber story is not necessarily just the material and it is an amazing material timber that's got so many possibilities to it but it's the kind of the paradigm shift in the construction industry and how manufacturing of buildings is moving more to a factory space than to as we traditionally do it working on site with small elements so a lot of this is you know the the key word that they say is designed for manufacturing and assembly and this is just the the key ideas that i want to bring out the other presenters have covered a lot about what CLT is and what the possibilities of CLT are. We're talking about FSC and certification, um, the fire safety. We have actually had fire testing done on our panels and, you know, just a hundred mil pine panel, you get a 60 minute fire rating and a hundred mil eucalyptus panel, you get 90 minutes uh, fire safety. So the fire issue, while a lot of people initially are concerned that it's wood and it's going to burn it is something that is dealt with um, and is actually very good in large buildings for fire safety in comparison to steel or concrete um, with the rebar in it which can fail at very high temperatures and then the carbon sequestration and carbon storage we talked about so that's the, the embodied energy story and how a change in concrete compared to wood and the saving of CO2 that you get from that. So yeah, the, the main types of mass timber that we know or we work with in South Africa are glue lamb, which has been around for a long time, and then the CLT, which is the new kind of sheer element of mass timber. And then, yeah, it, it, it is pretty much what it says it is. You know, we make layers of timber, which are set up at 90 degrees to each other. We go from 40 mil thick up to 200 mil thick. Currently our press is, it's 8.5 long and 2.75 wide. The sizing of panels is an important thing to take into consideration and a lot of that is dictated by your transport. So, you know, you can transport on a truck with a 2.6 meter wide load with no permits. So we advise keeping your modules to the 2.6 meters. Obviously, if you need height, you know, we can make the panels up to eight and a half meters long so you can get your height by just flipping the panel on this side. So yeah, the, the technology that's coming out and that we're seeing in uh, the timber industry, it's really amazing. A lot of it has been seen before, you know, it's the kind of the industrial robots that uh, come in from UCA and ABB. These are typically found in car manufacturing facilities. But, uh, and do repetitive operations over and over. But with the new technology, and especially with the help of Autodesk for us personally, we, they've helped us develop a package which allows us to use an industrial robot, like the ABB one in the picture, for our cutting. It does mean that we have to kind of streamline the whole process of the information that we get to what goes to the site. And a majority of this work is actually done 
via the, the engineers. So whoever the engineer is on the project, you know, the BIM type of software does make a huge difference in this type of manufacturing because you are designing in 3D and designing in the panelized format. And then essentially we make exactly what comes out of these drawings. So you can go into very fine detail with your sizing and be confident that it'll all fit together like a, like a Lego or a puzzle. So this is not our factory, but this is similar to the robot that we have. We use the, you know, the industrial robot with a spindle on it or a saw blade, which allows us to cut to very high precision. So these machines can cut to like 0.2 millimeter precision, but it is timber. So you have to allow for a certain amount of tolerance within it. The standards allow for a three mil tolerance. We are working towards a 1.5 mil tolerance. But to me, it's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a living type of material. So it does change a little bit with moisture content and depending on where it's going. And we find quite often that there is maybe an expectation of what the finished timber product would, will be, because we've all seen these amazing images on Park Daily or design uh, uh, websites, and you're always seeing very high quality exposed CLT, which is amazing, amazing thing to use. But there's a lot to be said for the structural CLT, which often you don't even see. You know, to replace the brick or concrete within a building with structural timber, you know, that's your best carbon saving and also helps with the speed of production. So there's kind of two sides to, to mass timber and CLT. The one is kind of a high end finished product, which obviously has its costs involved. And the other is a mass timber structural element, which allows you to build big quickly. We use the industrial robot to that a lot of the bigger factories, they use large CNC's. Like you can see the size of the element that they're showing there and you know, the precision that you would need to cut something that size for it to be able to clip together like that. These really are amazing machines. And then it's coming to a point where they're starting to use the, the robots and, this, and the machinery, not only for cutting and machining of the timber, but also now for assembly. So as you can see here, this is in uh, the university in Zurich where they had the assembly line uh, building timber frame structures with the robots. This is not our factory, but is similar to how we are set up with vacuum press. They have a large CNC in the background, obviously we, we're using the robot. This is kind of the BIM type of information that we would get or work towards. As, the, as it becomes more and more commonly used, we'll, we'll find that the engineers will be supplying us with the kind of shop drawings almost, you know, the, the panelized format of what they require for the buildings, and then we are solely a manufacturer. But we do offer the service where we can take the drawings and then turn them into this panelized format for manufacturing. This Dalton Lane, this is the project. You can see here, this was used as the main structural element. I believe they actually cleared this in brick after. And then, yeah, you, you know, the manufacturing of the panels is one side that's kind of an element, but the production in the factory allows for you to build these full type of components, kind of um, what Tessa had showed you at the ridge where they did the full facade element in the factories before they arrived. Yeah, that was us working late nights on uh, the ridge project. And then yeah, and the panels were packed and sent away. So yeah, this offsite construction is uh, become a very important thing to consider. We can already see that companies like um, Marriott are doing prefabricated hotel rooms, kind of fully fitted out, which then get craned into place. And then yeah, you know, if the savings in manpower and the speed of construction, which this then allows to happen. Again, this is just, you know, the CAD type of software and the detail that you can go into with the designing of the panels. And then kind of what can be made with this type of technology. This is, uh, I believe, in Spain, and it's something that would never have been able to be done before. We had the BIM type of technology and the connection with the manufacturing machinery. 
And that's it. Uh, X Land in Cape Town, and there are contact details if you want to get a hold of us. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Thank you for, for covering that. It's nice to always see it from a manufacturer's perspective and to see the process that you, you go through. So I'd like to just uh, invite some questions from the audience. And there is a question here from Francois, and I think it's directed to you, um, Jamie. And Francois, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. do you mind just putting your mic on and then asking that question? Hello, Jamie, um, Francois here. There was a, a firm of engineers who had a project for you recently. And the problem that it couldn't go ahead was that the, the assembled parts of uh, CLT into some form of a structure has not been fire tested in an assembled form in South Africa as yet. Can you tell us a little bit more about that complication and how we see that being overcome in the future? Actually, not 100% sure which project uh, it is that you're referring to. We have had fire tests done through Stellenbosch University, which again were panel tests. So it gave a fire rating for the, the individual elements. A lot of this type of research has been done internationally and full fire tests and full burn tests. We do have some catching up to do for sure. And I do believe that there's a professor at Stellenbosch University who does have plans for full fire tests, kind of compartment tests. Okay, good. Definitely hope it makes its way into, into SANS. Uh, oh, Tessa, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I can add to that. Yeah, Please. so Francois, you're right. There haven't been any assemble, any tests in South Africa thus far. And even globally, the fire tests on different assemblies and different configurations of connections is quite limited in what has been done. But there's a lot of work happening in the US at the moment, along with uh, revising their codes and a lot of fire tests happening there. And certainly Richard Wallace at the University of Stellenbosch, who I think Jamie was referring to earlier, he is certainly has plans for those. So I think that there's going to be a huge amount of development in the next years, but it's quite a complex thing, fire and connections. And certainly once those connections have been fire tested, it's, it's only that, that exact configuration that is then fire tested. So it may be that for very man, many projects in the future, there may need to be bespoke fire tests conducted for different connections in South Africa. Thanks, Tessa. And I think that other part of the question is a key one on that's just linking it with the insurance companies too. That's, a, that's one of the important incentives that will drive this as well. Are there other questions that you have for any one of the speakers or presentations that you saw? Let's start with you, uh, Raymond Smith, please, far away. Thank you for that. Cost-wise, if we talk about a standard house, brick and mortar compared to this technology, where, where are we standing? Do we have figures on this yet? Okay, so any one of you can take that question, Tessa, Emma, or Jamie, or... Cost-wise, um, internationally at the moment, the price of CLT has jumped immensely, and that's kind of just as a result of COVID, and we've seen the same with steel and other materials. Our manufacturing, luckily, is all local materials, so we're not really as uh, affected by the currency exchange and by the transporting. They did do a few research projects at Stellenbosch University. One was a comparison for a large-scale building with uh, RC building, uh, reinforced concrete versus timber. And we have had some comparative costings done just for a regular build versus the CLT for smaller type of projects. Obviously, our cost of labor is much lower in South Africa than it is in most places in the world. So. On a small scale, it is difficult for us to compete, but it doesn't mean that we are more expensive. We are cost comparative on a smaller scale. But on a large scale, we are arguably much cheaper because of the speed of construction that you can achieve with this type of uh, build. You know, they're talking 30 to 40 percent reduction in your program for a build like this. So, you know, square meter cost, that's always a difficult thing to say, but uh, we cost comparative just with the speed. Okay, thank you. Matthew, please, your question. And and feel yeah. free to state who you're directing it to. Whoever can answer it. Go for it. Um, 
I've got actually a couple of questions, but um, just stop me if I get too long-winded. So the first yeah, question let's take is... One, um, let's take one for now, please. Okay, I think the most critical thing from a commercial point of view is supply and demand. Is the timber that's being used for mass timber, in, for example, on the ridge, was that imported? Was it local? And if there is a sufficient capacity or demand, will there be sufficient capacity locally or does it have to be all imported? I'm not saying that imported timber is sure it's got a higher carbon footprint on this thing, that it's bad, it might still in the end have a lower carbon footprint than anything else. But yeah, what's the answer to that one? Tessa? I can answer. So to answer the first question, the timber on the ridge was grown in George and then shipped to Cape Town and fabricated by Jamie and his factory. So the CLT component was entirely South African. The cladding component was another story that was installed that was procured from overseas and somebody else has asked a question i'll talk more about that later yeah so so the clt component was entirely local in terms of our forestry i mean i think maybe david or emma well placed to respond in detail on that but we've got a huge number of fsc certified forests in south africa and at the moment we're not using all the timber that's being produced by them so sure once all the buildings that we build move to timber, yeah, there'll be a constraint on supply, as we're seeing across the world, especially in the global north. But there's quite a lot of space for well-managed FSC-certified forests and not bad un-FSC-certified forests. So it's time to grow trees. Okay. Thanks. David, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just uh, one comment on the back of uh, the query regarding local costs. I was speaking to one of the suppliers now recently with the European CLT, and uh, they noted that the jump, the increase in price, apart from the COVID supply chain, has been very significant, you know, numbers 60 to 80 percent. So Jamie's 100 percent right. Ideally, we should be uh, guys like Gerard and the guys in, in the forestry and, and the government, if it's possible to try and unlock some of the current logging that goes to either pulp or fuel, to head it towards the mass timber industry, which which unlocks more value. So going local definitely makes sense. And, and again, as Francois uh, Matthew asked in the question, you know, the, the demand for mass timber across the world has increased significantly. So the prices are not going to come down in, in a hurry. OK, good. Denise, do you want to ask your question? And then I'll go to some of the questions in the chat. Uh, Thanks, please, Denise. Lonnie. Thanks, Lonnie. I don't know who would be the best one to answer, but I'm just going to put, it's, it's a condensed kind of question. How does this stack up against the national building regulations with housing and affordable housing modular solutions? And then how does this also feature with regard to him at looking at the fire retarding agencies? We know him, Crete and stuff like that is very suitable for fire retarding material, but is there an application and how would that affect South Africa's market in that, you know, would, would, would there be a demand for that in the biodiversity as well? It's a random question out there. I think it covers about four bases, but yeah, fire retarding, affordable housing, cost point, national building regulations. Is this a competitor? Can, can we do some amazing work with this material? Maybe start with Gerard, who's in the forestry side and end up with David and Tessa. <laughs> Thanks, 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 Denise. Yeah. So let's let's get the biodiversity angle from Gerard. Gerard, do you want to come in there, please? Uh, yes, sure, Denise. Yes. So, well, the the biodiversity is contained within the forest management standard. You know, so when our forests are audited, those biodiversity criteria are audited. Okay, and that's obviously done on an annual basis. So it's a very important part of the forest management standard. In terms of the fire retardants, I'm not too sure whether we would be equipped to answer any questions on that, unless I misunderstood the question. Um, just sorry, yeah. sorry, Kilani. Just it's it's more in the sense of the biodiversity. Hemp being a very controlled licensed agreement for growing and stuff like that. Is that a challenge? You know, is it a solution? But is it also a challenge? Is it going to be an obstacle? because it could potentially be a deal breaker. David, do you want to come in there, please? Sure. Yeah. So, Denise, I think, in my opinion, might not be valued or agreed with, but that's why we have these debates. But I think mass timber and mass housing are not suited. They, they don't, they're not matching pairs. 
I think the you know Jamie is currently working on efficiencies, and as demand increases, so his prices might come or soften a bit. But for the mass housing industry, it's too expensive. Mm. Uh, and, and when I say mass housing, I mean, uh, you know, there's affordable housing. What is not impossible is if uh, guys unlock some technology with timber, like a SIPs panel, you know, a structurally insulated panel, and then certainly that and some combination of uh, fire resistant insulation could work. And then, then I think uh, your comment could make sense that it might be a technology between that and, and modular builds to, to achieve that. Okay, let's, let's just go to the chat. There's a question there. For you, Tessa, what did you use to protect the timber panels on the facade from the weather over time? Okay, so the facade panels are build up. So if we start from the inside out, the structural component of the panel is, I think it's about 19 millimeter thick CLT. So that provides the structure. Wrapping around that panel and on towards the outside is a breather membrane. So that actually pr provides the the belts and braces protection from the weather. On the outside of that are counter battens, and the reason that they're counter battens is to uh, is, is also for weather, and they're all shaped quite carefully to make sure that the water drips off instead of sits on top of the counter, counter battens because they're timber as well. And then outside of that is a cladding layer, which is imagined as sacrificial, but of course that's sacrificial over a 50-year lifespan. So we chose the cladding product, which is called a queer. That is a proprietary name for a thermally treated pine. So it's uh, Pinus radiata, which happens to be the same pine, pine species that we used for the CLT, except in this instance, it's grown in New Zealand and then treated and then shipped around the world until we bought, we bought it here. But the benefit of it is that it comes with a 50 year guaranteed lifespan without any maintenance required or any painting required. So there's quite significant benefits there. So that's sacrificial cladding with a 50 year lifespan is the first stop of the weather. And then at the top of the panel, there's an um, aluminium flashing that stops the water coming in between the cladding and the CLT panel. And of course, along the way, quite a lot of drips and, and open areas for water to exit should it get into that void between the cladding and the timber. Cool, so that answer thanks. question. <laughs> Uh, thanks for that. Al, you've got a question. If you could please fire away. Right. Thank you very much. In terms of expansion and contraction of the CLT panels, and when you design for manufacture, you obviously have to try and reduce your, your tolerance as much as possible. I should imagine that the cross laminating reduces the expansion because the timber expands mainly across the grain as opposed to in the length of the grain. However, there must be some sort of coefficient of expansion that we should be able to design to and understand. That's the one thing. The other part of it is that if you treat a timber, and this is say CCA or boron that we do in South Africa, you one does it under pressure treatment, the water content goes right up to about 25, even up to 40% sometimes, and one has to bring it back down to ambient uh, moisture content to be able to machine it. And as far as I understand, CLT is not treated. And then how does that comply then in terms with national building regulations and the requirement for all structural timber to be treated? So those are some of my questions. I think I can answer quite a bit of that. So the national requirements for treatment are mainly in coastal areas. It's not the entire country. So inland you can have untreated CLT. You're quite right about the pressure impregnation and the issues that that causes. Yeah, you know, if we were CCA treating or boron treating, it would mean that we would have to treat a huge portion of timber and then dry back down, which would be months of treating, of drying. The, um, Moisture is obviously something that uh, you've got to take into account with any laminated timber product. So we have similar issues that you would have with glue lamb beams. This is kind of differential drying where two planks have got a slightly different moisture content. Or when you're sending panels from one area with the equilibrium moisture content, like in Cape Town, which is around 15%, sending it up to Joburg where it's much drier or sending it to Durban where it's uh, higher humidity. So you, you see in the panels either 
the joints between the planks opening up when it dries or them starting to push against each other if it is a lot of moisture in it. These are kind of superficial effects in uh, relation to the structure of the panel. Structurally, the way that they're, ma they're manufactured, it's gonna hold together. And as a full size panel, your overall movement within the panel, you know, the expansion or contraction is minimal because you are cross laminating. So it's more issues with kind of checking in the timber, you know, where the timber will crack inside because it's uh, being pulled and, and dry. Treatment is a big issue. We can do a Vaxol treatment, which is a permethane pesticide that goes into the timber. We don't do any CCA treatment. It's not a nice chemical to be working with in the factory. And the Vaxol isn't a nice chemical to be working with in the factory either. Uh, we are trying to push for the boron type of treatments more and more. And I think that uh, you know, there's a lot of potential for boron treated panels in South Africa. This is similar to what they're doing in Australia. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thanks, thanks Al for that for that question and, and thanks Jamie for your response. Man, I'm at pains to say we have to close the session and my apologies that we didn't give you a lot more time with those questions and we'll definitely do a follow-up to this. I think there are other questions we have around costs, the legislative framework, but the other technical questions that are there as you can see in the chat uh, that we'd like to understand more. So just allow me, please, to close the session. And thank you very much, uh, Jamie, and uh, all of you for your presentations. And we just want to sum up and in telling you about what's coming, that in December, we won't be having a session, as you most of you know, that every time, uh, the last Thursday of every month, we have a webinar. So in December, there isn't one. And then on the 27th of Jan, there's a core certification that will go through. and Maybe we haven't put the others because I think maybe one of them will be on Mass Tim, but just a follow up on that. And this is just a reminder for you to follow us on those two platforms. You'll get more information on when we're going to have some of these events. One of the things that we're promoting is this Living Future accreditation that you may want to just get into this regenerative design thinking mass timber being one of the small components well important of course components in in this regenerative design process that we think about and the living future institute provides very insightful information on that we want to say thank you to our sponsors roof tech for sponsoring this event and making it possible and for us to be able to have also that cpd points and want to say thank you to the speakers we really enjoyed the insights that you shared. Very it technically sound for all of us to understand what it is and really going back to the fundamentals of it all. I'm sure you all had some a boatload of questions I did too. And so we might just invite you once more to, to come and address us. But what you shared with us was very useful information. And we can't not thank the rest of the team for being able to put this presentation and webinar for all of us here that you to enjoy. So with that, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming through and we look forward to seeing you again in January. So that's all from us from the Regenerative Collaborative South Africa. Have a lovely weekend and enjoy a restful break. So see you next year. Mm -hmm.